Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson. I am your host and a technical consultant for Altium. And today we are gonna be looking at a viewer question around high-speed design and specifically how long should stubs be on your vias? Now this is a great question and if you read a lot of the design guidelines out there about high-speed design and about high-speed routing, Generally, everybody says, well, just remove all the stubs. The problem is that this is actually too expensive. You can never completely remove the stubs, and sometimes you don't need to remove the stubs. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first let's look at this viewer question around back drilling and stubs on vias for high speed signals. Walid Arshad writes, Hi Zach, I'm back with another question. This time it's related to high speed stuff. Then he goes on to mention that he is working with high speed signals with a data rate of 56 gigabits per second, Nyquist frequency at uh, 14 gigahertz with PAM4 signaling format. And then others have a data rate of 116 gigabits per second, so that gives a 29 gigahertz Nyquist frequency. And so the question is, what should the allowed back drill be? Now, he mentions here in the last sentence, the fab vendor that I am currently working with is having some issues with back drilling lately, and they cannot go below 25 mil stub for back drilled vias. Could you please weigh in on this? Will a 25 mil stub be pathological for these signals? So this question brings up a couple of important things. So first of all, the question is, what should you expect from your fab vendor? Or what should you expect from the fabrication house, I mean? So how small should they be able to make your stubs? How small do you need to make them? And then also, assuming that you can get to a given length for your stubs, what frequency could they support? Now these are all obviously interrelated questions and to really break it down, you need to understand how a stub on a via can act like a small transmission line. So normally when you are routing high speed signals in a PCB and you need to make a layer change, you might not make that layer change all the way through the PCB. If you go from say a surface layer to one of the inner layers and you're just using a standard through hole via, there will be some little bit of via left over. And the question is about whether or not you can actually tolerate that leftover via on that route. Okay, so let's look at this from the side view so we can kind of see what we're talking about here. So we have our side view of our PCB. Here's my trace. I hit my via pad and we've got a through hole via. And let's just say instead of going all the way down to L4, we go down to L2. So we've got a four layer board. There's L1, L2 and L3. And then this is L4. When we have our signal, let's say it starts right here and it then propagates through this interconnect. What can actually happen here is we have a section of copper here that acts like an open transmission line. There is some input impedance here and this will then determine how the signal content that propagates into this section of the interconnect can then reflect and then come back out onto the rest of the interconnect. So if you remember our discussion of input impedance, input impedance will basically create a phase response and it can create a reflection here at this interface. Some of that power can reflect off of this open end of the transmission line, because remember, this is basically unterminated. And then that power can then come back out and interfere with this portion of the digital signal. Our signal, if you remember from our uh, discussion on digital signal bandwidths, can be modeled as essentially being a bunch of different peaks of different frequencies. Each of these frequencies will experience or interact with this section of via in different ways. And so we wanna make sure that this via does not create too much distortion of all of this power in the digital signal that could then cause this signal to be totally unreadable once it reaches the other end of the interconnect. Connect. So if we want to look at how this section of transmission line affects a signal, essentially what it does is it could create some loss. So instead of looking at this in terms of a digital signal, it actually helps to look at this in terms of an analog signal. Because remember, all digital signals can be modeled as essentially being a big sum of an infinite number of analog signals. You want to figure out what is the highest frequency analog signal that you can transmit through this interconnect for a 
given length of this stub. So let's say we have a signal and this is the wavelength of the signal and it eventually travels in here and then starts traveling this direction on L2. Now, if it gets into this section of the via, what can happen is if this wavelength corresponds to a quarter wavelength being equal to this value here, L of this via, or this stub, I should say, then what will happen is this wave will experience a 180 degree phase shift by the time it travels down here, reflects, and then comes back. So what will happen is the initial wave will essentially be like this when it's on the interior layer, but the reflected wave can then essentially be like this. It can be totally out of phase. And when the two waves then interact on this section of the interconnect, they cancel each other. They interfere destructively. And this would essentially give you zero power. Okay, so the reflected wave here in the stub and the wave that then gets transmitted here through on L2, um, they essentially cancel each other out. Now, this doesn't just happen at lambda over four. So we have one frequency here, we'll just call it F1, and that corresponds to lambda equals four times the wavelength. Because remember, we're fitting a quarter wavelength here inside of this stub, but Whenever we have an open termination here, we could then fit another lambda equals, or sorry, I should say three quarter lambda equal to L. So here we've basically got maximum amplitude here, we've got zero here, and this would be half our wavelength. So we've now fit three quarters of a wavelength into this resonator. And that gives us our next frequency. So our next frequency is gonna be at 4L over three. So again, I just equate these two, solve for lambda, that's what we get. So we're gonna call this F sub three, and it corresponds to this wavelength. Each time I keep adding this section of half a wavelength to this wave, I can always ensure that I have a maximum displacement here at this end of the via, and that will allow me to then fit five lambda over four into this via stub, or seven lambda over four into this via stub. So this gives us a general value for the frequency that will then create this strong loss on this interconnect. So those frequencies correspond to this wavelength Lambda n equals 4L over n, where n is an odd number. And then since I know the wavelength and uh, there is some uh, propagation velocity or a speed, um, we can just call it V sub P or we can call it C, whichever symbol you want to use, but there's some wave speed that corresponds to the wave travel along this interconnect, then we would know that we can solve for the frequencies, F sub n is just equal to whatever the value of speed is in this interconnect divided by lambda sub n. This value for the speed of this wave is just the speed of light in the material. So that's speed of light in vacuum divided by lambda sub n times square root of dk effective. So there's some effective dielectric constant that the signal actually sees as it travels through here. It's not just the value of dk that you read off of the data sheet. There's actually a formula you can use to calculate DK effective inside of this structure. But essentially what happens here is you see that we've got all of these different frequencies that produce really strong loss of this signal. So the way that we would actually look at those in the frequency domain is to look at the S parameters. So the S21 value. Okay, so if this is frequency, and this is the S parameters, then essentially your S parameter spectrum for S21 would look something like this, where you get really strong losses at these progressively higher frequencies. So this right here corresponds to uh, lambda equals four times the length of the stub. So this is my F sub one value. Here, this is lambda equals four L over three. This is my F sub three value and so on and so forth. So the next one would be F sub five, F sub seven, and so on and so forth, all the way out into infinity. And so you wanna make sure that the bandwidth of your signal just basically fits within this section of the S parameter graph. And so as you make L larger, 
what you would end up doing is you'd actually end up making your wavelength larger. And if you make your wavelength larger, you see it's here in the denominator, that makes these frequencies go down. So in order to extend the bandwidth of this insertion loss spectrum, you would then need to make L smaller. So that's why we always say, back drilling is needed on high speed signals. It's because you're increasing the bandwidth of the channel by moving these valleys in the S parameter spectrum all the way out to higher frequencies or as high as you po can possibly get them. So now that we figured out the frequencies that actually produce strong losses in our interconnect, later what we'll do is actually look at the data rates that those correspond to and that those channels can actually support. So that gets to the heart of the question. What data rate can you actually support in your high speed PCB? We'll look at that in another video coming up soon. Thanks everybody. Yeah.